Okay, started the recording. This is a really a long after class, uh, and this is the last topic of the total thermal uh, topic, last uh, heading of the total thermal topic, which is evaporation that we left to discuss. Evaporation actually a pretty interesting thing because it handles the state change of liquids far lower than their boiling temperature, which is actually quite interesting. I'll try to make sense with you for evaporation and in different terms that's related to evaporation and how can we have its advantages and how can we use it and so on and so forth. One of the primary thing that we have to understand that let's say currently the temperature of Dhaka city is around let's say 22 degrees Celsius and this is far below than 100 degrees Celsius. Even so at this temperature the air has some moisture. So air has moisture. Now, one of the key concepts that you need to understand that this will essentially mean that air has gaseous state water molecules, H2O molecules. But the temperature is below 100 degrees Celsius. So is it supposed to happen? I mean, is it supposed to happen? I mean, can this happen? <laughs> the answer is an undoubtedly yes. It is possible and it is happening. One of the key part that you need to understand that the state of an object solid liquid or gas is not exclusively controlled by temperature i'm saying this again the state of an object solid liquid or gas is not exclusively dictated by temperature there is an equally important and powerful factor which is called pressure pressure can have significant factor on the boiling temperature and, and melting temperature state change temperatures of, an, of any object. Uh, this is the information that you need to know. This next part that I'm going to tell you is not a part of the syllabus, but I'm just showing you this to give you some idea that for any object, we can draw a pressure versus temperature graph, which is a graph like this. And we can actually plot that at which point an object is going to be at what stage. This is what we call the phase diagram of an object. And the phase diagram for water looks somewhat like this here it is steam here it is solid and here it is gas it's it's such it's more or less like this uh sorry not gas this is liquid so what the reason i'm showing you this graph is to give you an idea that uh you for a certain combination of pressure and temperature, you can pretty much have the substance H2O that we call water at any stage, at any 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 state, or even at any uh, transition state. For example, if you if you set up a, if you have a container of water and then you can control the pressure and temperature of that container very effectively over a very large range of pressure variation and temperature variation both, and if you set uh, the container's temperature somewhere over here. Uh, at these coordinates of pressure and temperature, then you're gonna find the all the water will be st at steam at steam uh, state or gas state. If you set it up over here, using the same temperature, you are just increasing the pressure by a little bit. At this temperature, you will experience what is called sublimation. <coughs> sublimation basically means it is the process of gas directly converting into solid. So we'll see that over here. There'll be no liquid transition. And if you do the opposite, then you can see the opposite as well. Solid things will be converted to gaseous state directly, which is more commonly visible for the case of dry ice. Many of you might have seen that if we have dry ice, which is a solid carbon dioxide, and if we keep it on room temperature, uh, we'll see that the dry ice will produce a very uh, dense white smoke. So the solid would directly convert into a gaseous state. Uh, at atmospheric pressure. So the temperature and the pressure combination of atmospheric pressure and room temperature doesn't allow carbon dioxide to become liquid. For carbon dioxide liquid, the pressure had to be even more. So it can transfer between from solid to gas directly. And the reverse of solid to gas is what we call sublimation. Uh, sorry, uh, I mean, for whenever something converts from gas to solid directly. So this is the important bit that you need to understand <coughs> that only temperature is not the key factor. Pressure plays a very equally important role. And, and these are all these lines uh, that you can see there, I represent the transition uh, combination of pressure and temperature. And there is this one dot over here where all of these three lines actually merge. This is what we call the triple point of water. 
the triple point of water this is the combination of pressure and temperature there is only one set of values one specific pressure value and one specific temperature value for which the water can coexist in all three of its state uh, if you wonder that what does that even mean i mean how do we how do we how do we uh, how do we, how do we visualize that uh, one of the ways you can visualize this uh, is this example is not very good, but it can be functional to some extent. Did you guys remember uh, study about reversible reactions in your chemistry? Reversible reactions. Did you guys come? Did you guys come across it? Did all of you come across it? Reversible reactions. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <clears throat> good. What happens in the equilibrium of a reversible reaction? The reaction doesn't actually stop. It's a dynamic equilibrium state it means there is equal rate of forward reaction and reverse reaction so it means that in the same amount of time equal number of uh, uh, reactant molecules produces uh, products and product molecules produce reactants so it's a dynamic process but the total number or the total concentration pretty much remains the same what happens in the triple point you can think about it that within in, in the triple point scenario the amount of uh, water that you have in terms of let's say mole number because we cannot say or in terms of kg mass is a fixed number irrespective of state the amount of water that you'll have all of these water molecules can naturally transfer from solid to liquid or liquid to gas or something something to something, to something. but they would always they would do this in such a way that they would maintain preferably a fixed amount of sum of heat energy within themselves it means that if the total amount of heat energy available within this container is pretty low then most of the water molecules will prefer to stay aside in the solid state because solid is a less energetic state of of the of the substance liquid is a bit more energetic state and gaseous state is is the most energy state so if we have a very low amount of energy content i mean we are maintaining pressure and temperature and somehow we have reduced the heat also uh, uh, also very very well then there would be more solid uh, and vice versa so how much heat is available within the container can be a measure for uh, how we can achieve this you might wonder that what does that even mean i mean how can we have more or less heat where, where we are actually fixing up the temperature that can be achieved through a complex series of uh, progression i mean that to achieve different amount of heat energy for the same value of pressure and temperature, the sequence of uh, approaching that uh, combination for different uh, different combination is actually quite complicated. It's an experimental procedure which requires a lot of explanation. I'm not going to get into that. This whole figure is also not in your syllabus. I'm telling you this because I want you to understand this. So that's the whole significance of triple point. The reason triple point is so important, one of the basic uh, uh, cause that I'm actually taking so much time to explain this is that the SI unit of temperature, which is Kelvin, is defined based upon the triple point of water. Kelvin temperature is defined that one Kelvin temperature is 1 by 273.15 part of the triple point of water. So if we fix up the, if you can find somehow find out the triple point of water, <coughs> so that there is a fixed pressure value and there is a fixed temperature value. This temperature value is precisely 273.15 Kelvin. So if you take one part of it into 273.15, what you get is one Kelvin. This from the triple point, the uh, Kelvin scale is defined. It also tell, we also already known that one Kelvin uh, equals to 273. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, my bad. Uh, Zero degrees Celsius equals to 273 Kelvin. You have you have uh, 273 Kelvin. You have seen this equation very well. You haven't seen this uh, uh, other two digits, but in the for the sake of accuracy and not confusion over the entire world and scientists and everyone, uh, the definition essentially have this essentially has this five SF number to avoid confusion, and that's pretty much it. And what is even more interesting, and I'm just telling you this. I'm not going to explain this that the melting temperature of water in kelvin scale is 273.16 kelvin let me just show you the definition of one kelvin <coughs> uh where is uh, definition of one kelvin Wiki.
Oh, never mind. They have recently changed this uh, definition as well. Oh, no, I had, I messed it up as well. Yep, I messed it up. <coughs> Did I mess it up? Why Wikipedia is taking me into somewhere else? Uh, uh, oh, okay. So whenever we're using triple point, so the pressure is uh, a fixed value is about 4.55 millimeter of mercury. The temperature is 273.16. But if we consider atmospheric pressure, then it is 273.15. Okay, <coughs> that's the difference. So this was supposed to 273.16. I I messed up. My bad. This is by definition it's not 273.16. I forget these two things pretty often. And this was supposed to be 15. This is the melting point of water. Anyway, <coughs> my point being that state change can be pretty interesting and pressure and temperature both play a role. And even at temperatures lower than 100 degrees Celsius, we can have water molecules present in our atmosphere. Now, this idea of water molecules being present in the atmosphere brings us to the next step of what we should understand for the word humidity. What do we mean by the word humidity? <coughs> Let me elaborate the point humidity. You guys have learned about uh, solution in your chemistry classes and whenever we make any solution we have a solvent which is basically typically a liquid and we have a solute which is which can be a liquid or it can be a solid if we take a very simple example of let's say a glass of water and we are trying to add some sugar and we're trying to make a sugar water solution what happens that if we add a small teaspoon of sugar you stir it a little bit it's going to dissolve pretty fast we call it a uh, uh, we do call it an uh, uh, unsaturated solution, which means this solution has the capability to welcome more sugar water particles. So you can take another teaspoon and put it there and give it a stir, and maybe that also goes away, but takes a bit more time. You can keep on repeating this thing, and eventually there will come a point that you, no matter how much you stir, uh, stir the solution, some uh, sugar particles would always be left at the bottom of that thing, of the glass. This is what we call a. Uh, 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 this is what we call a. Uh, saturated solution a saturated solution essentially means i mean one of the way one of the way to physically visualize this thing can be put it like that <clears throat> think about it let me give you another physical example let's say uh, this is actually a philosophy example but this can work pretty well let's say there is a jar a uh, big jar glass jar and that jar is built is filled up uh, is someone is filling filling up that jar with ping pong balls small ping pong balls so the jar is completely filled up with ping pong balls we give it a bit of a shake and everything so that they are, they are all the ping pong balls are very well stuck in and that's the ping pong ball if you are asked that is the jar full a more common explanation would be yes <coughs> the jar is full of ping pong balls but that's not essentially true because between the ping pong balls are spherical in shape so they are touching each other at two points on their surface <coughs> two ping pong balls are touching each other at one point with, with each other but there is gap in between gaps so or sort of like inter ping pong ball uh, space and if you take some let's say sand and start pour onto that jar you'll see that you can actually put into a significant amount of sand within this jar to fill up all of the internal inter ping pong ball space within that jar so even though initially before you start putting in the sand we, it appeared that the jar is completely full but technically speaking since you can put in more sand it is not actually completely full even so, if you fill up the whole thing with its sand and eventually beat up a bit of a tap and eventually fill it up all the way to the top and you can no longer uh, accommodate any more sand anymore, even at this level, you can take one glass of whole water and eventually pour into it and you will see that the water has gone out because water molecules are even smaller particles than the sand particles, which means the gaps that the sand particles have between them or sand, uh, sand particles that have, so water molecules could still occupy that space. And they can still uh, occupy that space and eventually get absorbed within the container. The point that I'm trying to make is that this is a very simplified version or, or, or a more uh, understandable version for how does humidity or any solution works like. <coughs> uh, it is, uh, if, you, if you go for a physical solution, 
if you have let's say one glass of water let's say within this one glass of water there are one billion water molecules i'm just taking random number one billion water molecules between one uh, among the in the in between space of this one billion water molecules you have some spaces where you can actually put some sugar molecules you have some spaces where you can put some sugar molecules whenever you give one teaspoon of sugar molecules it dissolves up and the sugar molecules are all split up from each other like entirely split up from each other there is no crystal structure anymore all the sugar molecules are perfectly sugar ca 6 h 12 6 and they are in their molecular form and they have taken their place in the in between spaces but because all the spaces are not filled up you could still introduce one more teaspoon of sugar and still give it a bit of a star and you can fill up more space you can keep on doing this as long as all of the space in between all the water molecules which could welcome and accommodate the sugar molecules are filled up. As long as there is a, even a one molecule space uh, available, you can add one more molecule of sugar. <clears throat> but the instant, all the spaces, all the welcoming spaces of the sugar molecules that could possibly exist in between all the one billion water molecules, the moment all of those spaces are occupied, you can no longer introduce more sugar molecules which should get in that space. So. In that scenario, you would have uh, particulate or, or residual sugar crystals uh, remaining at the bottom of your glass. That's basically the idea of a saturated solution. Humidity works pretty much in the same way. Humidity is also affected by temperature. I'm going to tell you about the effect of temperature just a bit while for the time for timing. Assume that the, we are assuming that the temperature is remaining constant. <laughs> at a constant temperature or at a fixed temperature, the air molecules, air molecules means the whole atmosphere. Let's use the term atmosphere molecules or atmosphere particles. Atmosphere particles would mean everything that makes up the atmosphere, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, uh, some bit of uh, neutral gases, dust particles, everything. Sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, uh, all sorts of pollutants and everything that makes up the atmosphere. At a fixed temperature, the atmosphere particles do have a fixed amount of empty space between them to welcome water molecules. If you keep on sending water molecules into the atmosphere, slowly those spaces would get filled up and filled up and filled up. If when all the spaces would become filled up completely, that atmosphere can no longer accept any more gaseous water molecules. This is the state of the atmosphere that you could say 100% humid. 100% humid does not mean that this atmosphere is made up with 100% water molecules, no. It simply means this atmosphere is at its capacity to accept water molecules. I'll say this again. A 100% humid atmosphere does not mean that this entire atmosphere is only steam molecules. It only means it is a normal atmosphere which has taken all the water molecules that it could possibly take and it cannot take any more. It means all the welcoming voids for water molecules are filled up. And whenever the atmosphere has less than that, we call it uh, less than 100% humidity. For example, the atmosphere can be 50% humid, 20% humid, 70% humid. And depending on the humidity level, our comfort is equally re re related. Why our comfort is related to humidity? I'm going to explain that a bit later. But did you understand, did, you, did all of you, all, all six of you, understand the key concept of what do you mean by 100% humidity? Yes, sir. Everyone. Please respond. Yes, Voice sir. or chat. Okay. Apparently, there is no question. So, I assume that to my boot show. So, as long as atmosphere is not 100% humid or not saturated with water water molecules, water vapor molecules, uh, it can take more uh, more more uh, water molecules, and that's how evaporation works. I mean, you can only have evaporation happening from the open surface of a liquid body, let's say water body, because water is the most common liquid that we talk about. So I'm going to be using, uh, I might be using the term liquid and water alternately in my upcoming discussion. But if I say liquid, assume water. If I'm saying water, assume water. And you can pretty much uh, replace the water with any liquid. And I, by saying any liquid, I mean any liquid. Even mercury is also a liquid. So you can, uh, evaporation is possible for any liquid. But all that matters is pressure and temperature. Is it going to be ha happening? Is it going to be happening fast? Is it going to be happening slow? Is it not going to be happening? All of these questions can be answered by the two variables, pressure and temperature. So, uh, disregard the uh, transition between liquid and water in my discussion because I mean both of them to be the same thing for the upcoming part. So, 
if we have some water in an open container where the surface is open, I mean, the water molecules are directly exposed to the atmosphere. And if the atmosphere is not saturated or it is not 100% humid, the atmosphere will be able to absorb uh, surface molecules from the water surface. And that absorption is what we call evaporation. The definition of evaporation goes like this. I'm going to say it slowly, maybe twice as well. So <laughs> listen, Mark, the definition of evaporation goes like this. The transition, uh, should I use the term transition? Mm. No, let's just, let's just data state start from the key point. High energetic liquid particles leaving the liquid surface, leaving behind low energy liquid particles and converting themselves from liquid state into gas state is called evaporation. So let me break this down. <coughs> First of all, uh, if I go back to evaporation, uh, okay, evaporation, can I, can I take all of it? Yes, beautiful. So if, 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 if I try to break down the different definition of evaporation, there are multiple parts of it. First of all, evaporation should happen from the surface and surface only. Only high energetic particles can under, make evaporation. And then it produces cooling. optional point happens at all temperature means starting from the melting point all the way up to the boiling point evaporation can happen no big deal <coughs> more or less but evaporation will happen as as long as there is an exposed liquid in the atmosphere evaporation can happen irrespective of temperature that's it so that is very simple. You kids have learned about Brownian motion in your uh, uh, in your chemistry. Did you kids do that? Brownian motion. Do you know what that is? No. I can explain. Let me show you a bit of a uh, animation. Maybe that might actually help. Uh, Brownian motion in physics animation. <coughs> okay, I might actually have to uh, cut off this part of the video later because it has his uh, copyright stuffs, but I'm gonna keep it with. Uh, should I? Uh, I can actually pause recording. Is not recording? So, yeah. We just talked about the humidity rise and the uh, Brownian motion leading to the uh, high energy particle escape from the surface. And we're now talking about the cooling factor. So 238, 4.9. 4.9. 4.85, 4.9. 4.9. 4.9. 4.9. 4.9. 4.9. 4.9. 4.9. 4.9. 4.9. 4.9. 4.9. 4.9. 4.9. 4.9. 4.9. 4.9. 
the temperature of the liquid body starts to decrease. Try to understand. Let's say the temperature of this whole room is uh, 25 degrees Celsius. Let's say evaporation, and now we allow the evaporation to happen. We're not giving any heat to the room. The entire room, the atmosphere, water, container, everything has is at 25 degrees Celsius. Whenever evaporation will happen, high energy particles will go into the atmosphere. So the amount of energy in the atmosphere will become more. So in minute sense, the atmosphere will have a bit of higher temperature and the remaining water will have a bit of a lower temperature. That's one way to explain this thing. The other way to explain this thing is that if this was not happening within a closed room, let's say this was open to the actual atmosphere of the earth and this is the container and this was filled up with water and we are having, no, 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 no. And we are having evaporation from all the from the surface. We are having evaporation from the surface. Then we can assume that the atmosphere that it is surrounded by, this whole atmosphere, is always maintained at a fixed 25 degrees Celsius, assuming that. So whenever the temperature, whenever the evaporation will happen, the remaining liquid will experience a bit of drop of temperature. Now there's this is exactly where the process of heat transfer comes in. Try to understand. Let's say, uh, let's say we just place this container uh, over here and we are allowing the evaporation to happen. And if we put it a very sensitive temperature uh, right at the at close to the surface, for example, let's say if we put a temperature, if we put a thermometer right over here, a liquid in glass thermometer would not be a very good choice for this experiment. A thermocol thermometer would have been a better choice. So if we put a thermocol thermometer right at the uh, underneath the surface of the liquid, we would see that the temperature of the uh, of this layer is actually slowly getting down. As time will go by, it will gain, it will be getting down. But this drop will not happen continuously indefinitely. It will not happen indefinitely. What you need to understand that whenever the temperature of the water drops by one degree Celsius, it is possible that the atmosphere is at 25 degrees Celsius, but the water is at 24 degrees Celsius. If it drops by one more degree, the atmosphere would still be at 25 degrees Celsius and the water would be at 23 degrees Celsius. What, you what, what I want, to, want trying to show you, the reason I'm writing it in this manner, is that in this case, the temperature difference was one degree Celsius. In this case, the temperature difference between the atmosphere and the water body is how much? Two degrees Celsius. You need to remember that whenever temperature difference is more, the heat transfer rate is also more because nature naturally always tries to achieve equilibrium of temperature. Heat transfer always happens in such a way so that warm objects can become cooler and cooler objects can become warmer, which means that because the water body is experiencing some cooling effect by means of its evaporation and its temperature is getting dropped, as the temperature of the, of the liquid is gonna get dropped, it is then gonna start to absorb heat from the atmosphere, from the table, and from all those parts more strongly. Because the temperature is, when the temperature drop is more, when the temperature difference is higher, the rate of heat transfer will also become higher. So this temperature drop might keep on happening for a couple of degrees, but it will not happen indefinitely. Maybe after some time, let's say after giving significant amount of time, we'll find out that the temperature, the, the this thermocouple reading is, uh, let's say what, let's say 22.8 degrees. And it is not dropping any farther from there. I'm just choosing a random number. It might, it might as well be higher than that. Now, this is the temperature of the water and it is maintaining this temperature. What does this mean? That now we have a temperature difference of how much? If we do the subtraction of 25 minus 22.8, how much do we get? We get 2.2 degrees Celsius, right? So this means that when at a temperature difference of 2.2 degrees Celsius, the rate of heat loss because of evaporation, here the delta is leaving, has become equal to the rate of heat absorbed by means of conduction, convection, and radiation. So the liquid body has now reached a state of thermal equilibrium in such a way that its rate of heat loss because of evaporation has become equal to the rate of heat absorbed because of the temperature difference. And as long as the liquid is, will keep on evaporating, this liquid body will maintain this lower temperature. But it is not going to drop any further because you have to understand that the lower the temperature goes, more 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 strongly or more or faster or bigger amount of heat and will enter into the liquid body per second to maintain the equilibrium, to bring it back to uh, same temperature everywhere. That evaporation produces cooling, but this cooling, this cooling effect is not indefinite. There is a lower temperature at which it will not become cooled any further because at the temperature, the liquid body absorbs heat from the surrounding. At the same rate, it loses heat because of ev evaporation. Does this idea make sense? Yes, sir. 
এরপর আমাদের কিছু ফ্যাক্টর আছে ফ্যাক্টরগুলো আছে ওয়াট আর দ্য ফ্যাক্টর ফিজিক্যাল ফ্যাক্টর দ্যাট 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 ইনক্রিজেস ইভাপোরেশন সো আই এম জাস্ট গোনা গো ওয়ান বাই ওয়ান দ্য ফার্স্ট ফ্যাক্টর ইজ লার্জার সারফেস এরিয়া ইফ ইউ হ্যাভ এ লার্জার সারফেস এরিয়া ইউ উইল ডেফিনিটলি হ্যাভ মোর ইভাপোরেশন সো আই এম গোনা রাইট সারফেস এরিয়া ইউ হ্যাভ অল অফ দিস থিংস ভেরি ওয়েল ডিসকাসড ইন ইওর ফেডারেল বুক অর আই মিন দ্য গ্রিন বুক দ্যাট দ্যাট ইউ টিপিক্যালি ফলো সো ইউ ক্যান অ্যাকচুয়ালি লুক ইট আপ ফ্রম देयर uh it's not a very hard read i'm just going to telling you these factors i'm going to tell i'm going to give you more information for factors which are actually difficult to understand surface area is not difficult to understand if you have a bigger open surface you have more output per second uh if you have a smaller uh, surface area you have a less output per second so uh bigger surface area more more less less number two factor is temperature temperature is a very important factor if the liquid body temperature is increased then we'll see a uh, increased rate of evaporation one of the very common physical example that i can tell you that if you are handed over a cup of tea or a cup of coffee you'll see uh, white smoke is coming out of it but you will not see this if you are handed over a normal glass of water both of these things are having evaporation but the rate of evaporation from a warm or a hot cup of tea or coffee is so fast that atmosphere cannot absorb that or or this this uh, or what can i say uh, separate out those water molecules or the steam molecules so fast that they would become invisible right of the surface so that's why for a small height they maintain a fog slash cloud like uh, color which is the white smoke and after a certain height the atmosphere can actually uh, strip them apart completely so that it actually vanishes <laughs> so whenever temperature is higher there would be higher rate of evaporation this is also very obvious because at high temperature increased number of water molecules will have the capability to convert themselves from liquid to water state and vice versa and number 3 uh, is what do you say is the humidity of air this is very important humidity of the air means that the capability for the air to absorb further uh, water molecules or in uh, that's just uh, one way to explain this but the actual definition is that how much uh, relative water is water molecule is present within the atmosphere if the air is dry <coughs> it means it is less humid it will be more welcoming towards gaseous air, or, or air molecules and if the air is if the air is wet or it is really quite humid let's say 75 85% humid then it would be less welcoming towards uh, further intake so this is ex- exactly why uh, our, co- uh, our, our, our our we feel more comfortable uh, in dry environments or, or the air conditioners that we use artificial air conditioners that we use in our room in closed rooms air conditioners are responsible to do two things <coughs> they are responsible to reduce the temperature they are also responsible to reduce the humidity of the room that's why the air uh, that's why every air conditioner give us some water we have to have some way to uh, uh, transfer that water the reason is very simple our body works in such a way that because through our through the uh, through our skin every single every single instant we are continuously evaporating some uh, air uh, water out of our skin that evaporation process actually takes some heat away from our skin which gives us our skin a bit of a cool sensation or a temperature drop sensation which we consider to be a sensation of comfort if those water molecules which are given out from the capillary uh, uh, capillary t- uh, capillary uh, capillary what capillary veins can or capillary capillary tubes capillaries <laughs> if if those water molecules which are given out by the capillaries of our skin are not evaporated immediately we feel that part of our body is slowly becoming wet by its own jeteke amra typically bangla bhashay boli hocche je bhabsha gorom that atha atha lage মানে হচ্ছে যে উই আর সোয়েটিং কন্টিনিউয়াসলি বাট দ্য ওয়াটার মলিকুলস হুইচ আর রিচিং টু আর ড্রাই স্কিন অর ডেড স্কিন সেলস দে আর নট ইভাপোরেটিং অফ রেডিলি হুইচ মিন্স দে আর গেটিং স্টাক অন আওয়ার স্কিন অ্যান্ড উই আর ফিল ফিল দ্য আনকমফোর্ট ফিল ডিস আনকমফোর্টেবল উই ফিল আনকমফোর্টেবল ফ্রম দ্যাট সেনসেশন সো টু ফিল কমফোর্টেবল ওয়াটার মলিকুলস হ্যাজ টু ইভাপোরেট ইজিলি ফ্রম আওয়ার বডি and we have to be able to give out heat as much as possible you have to understand that we human beings are warm blooded animals which means we have a fixed temperature fixed core temperature and if we can dissipate heat more effectively we have a sense of comfort and if we cannot dissipate the heat heat continuously we have a sense of discomfort that's how our physiological system works so to extract heat from our body more effectively the atmosphere should be cool 
and also it should be dry so that water molecules leaving from our skin can be evaporated very easily and the temperature itself should be cool enough so that we feel the sensation of cold and that gives us the comfort so <clears throat> that's why humidity is very important now for how does it affect evaporation you already do understand that if the air is humid then there will be less rate of evaporation if the air is less humid or if the air is dry then there will be more rate of evaporation this is also why uh wet clothes dry faster in winter season compared to in in in, uh, in rainy season because in the rainy season the air is already quite wet there's enough water everywhere <laughs> but in the in the in the winter season the air is actually quite dry and this is also the same reason why in winter season our skin tends to crack because the air is so dry that it tries to pull off moisture from any place it can and it works uh, for that very strongly so from whenever uh, the depth of the water molecule absorption becomes so deep in our skin we actually can start to have uh, cracked skin and that's the problem number four factor that we discuss is what we call uh, air flow or wind <coughs> air flow on liquid this is also pretty important in the sense that uh, if on the liquid surface, if, if we allow a stagnant air atmosphere over here, or I don't know what is happening. This, this is a, a water, uh, water container and we are not having any airflow. So what will happen, the, this adjacent atmosphere will become humid first. And by boundary motion, the water molecules are definitely going to spread out. But if you think that the adjacent layer will always be the most humid, and then if, if you slowly start to observe further and further and further out, the humidity will be gradually less. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? <coughs> right at the source, the humidity will be most. Then by Brownian motion, the water molecules can dissipate it out further. So that would mean that the adjacent atmosphere with the water surface it will, will always be the most humid. Am I correct? So could you repeat this? The waters, water molecules are getting evaporated from the surface, from the surface, important. So if we do not provide any airflow, if we just, if you say air, which means it's not wind or it's not a gust or it's not anything, it's just a stagnant air, then water molecules are evaporated within this layer. So, and from this layer, water molecules are gonna be pushed out by Brownian motion. But the moment they become pushed out to the Brownian motion, more water molecules will be readily evaporated into this part, which essentially should tell you that the very adjacent layer of atmosphere would be the most humid. I mean, if the water molecule finishes over here, this is the whole water level, the closest air molecules will be, the closest air would be, would have a very high level of humidity. If you slowly start to observe further away, let's say if you measure the humidity right over here, let's say you might get 50%. If you measure it over here, you might get uh, 35%. If you measure it over here, you might get 25%. If you measure it over here, you might get 15%. Close to the water surface, the air will be really humid because that's where the water molecules are beginning produced. Right? Yes. Does this make sense? So it means that if we do, if we allow the, if we if we allow the uh, evaporation in a perfectly stagnant air, pretty soon the water level would be covered by quite humid air, not hundred percent humid, quite humid air. Other than that, if we set up a fan over here. And the fan is continuously blowing air onto the water surface. What's going to happen? It will be continuously flush off the humid air and put in fresh, dry air onto the water surface, right? So in that case, this water surface will be exposed to a dry air environment all the times, which will essentially increase the rate of evaporation. Do you understand what I'm saying? By applying the airflow, we are practically replacing the humid air and replacing it with fresh dry air which can accept the water molecules more effectively so having a uh, having a wind flow or air flow on the water surface will essentially increase the rate of evaporation yes sir yes sir acha erpor pass number factor hocche pass number factor ta ami bhule gechi amar boi kothay
আর ছয় নম্বর হচ্ছে প্রেসার ইভাপোরেট <coughs> or petroleum or oil other soybean oil they are all oils i mean as long as they are considered liquid they have some sort of evaporation properties but different type of fluid does have different type of evaporating properties by their own virtue uh, it's a comparison between the uh, uh, what is it called it's a comparison between the uh, adhesive force and the cohesive force did you guys learn these things anywhere maybe not yet okay disregard that the sixth the question uh, point number six is very important pressure this is a very important point and students tend to mess this up pretty well and i also mess this up pretty well let me clarify the idea of pressure very well i told you i showed you in the case for the for the case of the uh, at the beginning uh, whenever i was going over here <coughs> that pressure can play a very important role for the state change now do you kids understand how does a pressure cooker work did i did i explain this this to you in any of my earlier lectures can anybody tell me If not, I'll tell you again. No big deal. Okay, let me just tell you again. The way a pressure cooker works is by not allowing boiling to happen when water wants to boil. <coughs> try to think about it. At atmospheric pressure, I mean, try to visualize the atmospheric pressure as if the water surface of a container is being pushed from the top by a fixed by a certain amount of force and that force is in micro level that force is applied on each of the water molecules of the surface all the water molecules of the surface are being pushed down by the atmosphere's weight and that basically what produces the atmospheric pressure now if we start to heat up the water and slowly rise the temperature all the way up to 100 degrees celsius the individual kinetic energies or average kinetic energies of the water molecules become so high that they can overcome that they are intermolecular forces and they can also overpower the atmospheric force and can actually go in the opposite direction it means that they will not be going down because of the atmosphere atmospheric pressure they will be actually entering into the atmosphere because they have that much energy so the important bit you have to understand that for a liquid to be converted into gas hear me out on this one very carefully for a liquid to be converting into gas you need to pro make sure of two things first that molecule has to overcome the intermolecular forces among themselves this is a totally internal thing within the liquid to become liquid uh, gas from liquid <coughs> the liquid should liquid molecule should overcome the intermolecular attraction force of all the neighboring liquid molecules this is step 1 additionally that liquid molecule should have enough energy to enter into the atmosphere it means that it has to have enough energy to push out the atmospheric molecules out of its path and enter into that occupy that space because you have to understand that here the liquid try to visualize that in the liquid surface there are multiple liquid molecules which are all floating and everything suddenly whenever one liquid molecule has to become gas it has to actually enter into the atmosphere which means it will occupy a certain space in the atmosphere that was earlier not occupied by itself which means it will have to push out atmospheric molecules apart away to make its own space does it make sense you have to provide energy to make sure two things should happen the liquid particle should be able to overcome the neighboring attractions and it should also be able to push out atmospheric particles to occupy that space you have to provide energy to make sure both of these thing happen that's only when you can make a liquid liquid molecule convert into a gaseous molecule eri bujhte so মনে করো 
যে আমি একটু আগে জারের একটা एग्जांपल বলছি না আর্বিটালিয়ার আই ওয়াজ গিভিং এন एग्जांपल অফ জার দ্যাট দ্য জার ওয়াজ ইনিশিয়ালি ফিল্ড আপ উইথ পিং পং বলস লেটস সে দ্য জার ইজ জাস্ট ফিল্ড আপ উইথ পিং পং বলস and it was not given a bit of a shake to fill up the maximum it was just roughly fill up with ping pong balls by let's say uh, hauling over a pack of ping, uh, ping pong balls and it they just all went in now because it was not shaken you do know that if you now take one more ping pong ball although it looks perfectly filled up but if you now take one more ping pong, ping pong ball and try to push it into the container it might actually rearrange some of the neighboring ping pong balls to actually get in because you know that that much space should still be available does it make sense i mean is it logically practically making sense yes it's the same thing whenever a liquid molecule should become gaseous it has to push out the particles of the gas in the volume where it will occupy its space আমি যখন পিং পং বলটাকে লাস্ট পিং বলটাকে ঢুকাইতে হলে অন্য কিছু পিং পং বলকে সরাই তাকে নিজের স্পেসটা করতে হতো না ইট ক্যানট এক্সিস্ট কো এক্সিস্ট ইন দ্য সেম স্পেস দ্যাট আদার পিং পং বলস ওয়্যার অ্যাট ইট হ্যাজ টু মুভ আউট অর পুশ অ্যাওয়ে দোজ পিং পং বলস উইথ ইন দিস জার এন্ড অ্যাকচুয়ালি অকুপাই সাম স্পেস অফ ইটস ওন সাম ভলিউম অফ ইটস ওন রাইট ইন দ্য সেম প্রসেস whenever the boiling thing boiling well state change will happen evaporation or boiling however liquid particles will have to enter into atmosphere and to do that they have to physically push out atmospheric particles to occupy their own space bujhte ho ki bolte si yes sir so why am i telling you this because this is exactly where the pressure comes in if the pressure on the liquid surface is very strong the atmosphere will not want more liquid particles to get in this is not exactly similar to humidity humidity is the capability for a certain uh, certain uh, uh, atmosphere to take a, a, take uh, gas and particles pressure is about how much how much resistance or how much hindrance is the atmosphere causing onto the water molecules so that the water molecules cannot become steam molecules i mean atmosphere is not wanting the water molecules to enter into their gas state because of the pressure by applying the pressure they are suppressing that process if we reduce the pressure onto a certain amount of gas we'll see that the water will evaporate even more easily I mean, if it is even possible to boil water at zero degrees Celsius, if you reduce the pressure to that much, uh, to that much temperature, there are some pretty interesting YouTube videos about it. Boiling water at zero degrees Celsius. Just by reducing the pressure enough, you can allow the atmospheric particles to, uh, you can allow the water molecules to enter into the gaseous state very with very small amount of energy, and they can do that. <coughs> so why am I telling you this? I'm getting back to the point where I actually shifted off, uh, drifted off. That is, what happens within the pressure cooker? Try to think about it. Let's say this is a pressure cooker. Pressure cooker handle. Pressure cooker other other pressure handle. I'm going to pour it on the wall. Let's say here we have some water. I'm not uh, drawing cookable stuffs. Okay, let me just draw cookable stuffs. Let's say we draw some chicken and some. Okay, chicken. <laughs> so here we have some chicken, and we are about to cook it. So we are uh, uh, turning, turning on the heat, and the water is gonna start to boil pretty fast. And when the water is boiling, you can pretty much assume that the if the heat source is strong enough, you have to understand that the heat source is strong enough. Pretty soon, the water will be boiling with such a strong force that I mean, the rate of steam production will be so high that all the atmosphere, I mean, the basic atmosphere, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide mixture. will be pushed out of this container inside and this whole thing will be filled up with steam molecules right because it is continuously being produced from here it is uh, there is a continuous upflow of steam now if we do put a, do put in the on the lid and allow this process to come let's say now we have put on the lid and this is the nozzle of the pressure cooker and if we keep on applying the heat what will happen these steam molecules would not have any space to go go to the steam molecules would not have any space to go to which means now we are applying heat 
water is wanting to boil but the maximum number of water molecules or steam molecules that could possibly occupy this volume is filled up at this pressure and temperature the volume cannot get any bigger and there is not enough volume for more steam molecules to come in so what will happen the temperature of this water will start to rise and further evaporation or further boiling can only happen when the temperature of the water is higher because you should see over here that <coughs> where did it go here you can see that if you want to convert from liquid to steam this line is a higher pressure temperature do you see it's a, it's a, it's a going upwards which means if you increase the pressure and temperature both more liquid can convert into steam if you want to convert from liquid into steam you have to increase the pressure and temperature so what happens within the pressure cooker as we keep on applying heat when the temperature of the water becomes 100 degrees celsius water boils and it fills up the whole whole, whole inside and at this point the atmosphere doesn't want to allow any more water molecules to boil because it doesn't have any space to apply to uh, to to accommodate or to appreciate or to welcome any more water molecules so to penetrate within that atmosphere of of steam molecules these water molecules needs now needs to have even more energy than before so how can they have more energy now they will take energy from the heat source and the temperature of this water is going to start go higher than 100 degrees celsius maybe 101 102 103 water will be boiling at a temperature higher than 100 degrees celsius maybe let's say 110 degrees celsius so now the temperature inside the pressure cooker would be 110 degrees celsius which will be applicable to both the steam and also the liquid water now that's essentially what we do in pressure cooker we increase the pressure inside the inside the uh, <coughs> cooking uh, in the pressure cooker as a result the water starts to boil at a much higher temperature which ensures faster heat transfer to the cookable material 100 degrees celsius e tumi ekta object ke boil korte tomar je rate heat transfer hoyto tumi jodi oi jinish ta ke 110 degrees celsius e put korte paro tale heat transfer ro beshi hobe hobe kina bujhte cho yes sir so that basically how things cook faster but that's also why uh, fast cook pressure cooker food doesn't usually taste so good as a slow cooked meal because the thing that brings taste into a food is the intrusion or the or the entering of the spice molecules within that food whenever we cook something in pressure cooker pretty fast uh, if it's meat let's say then it will become boiled pretty fast but all the spice molecules would not get enough chance or would not get enough time to really enter deep into the fibers of the muscle so it would be edible but not so tasty on the contrary if we cook a certain amount of meat at low temperature for a long duration for example kachi kachi is one of the very slow cooked meal and it is done in a closed environment so none of the uh, spice molecules can actually escape they have to be within to get into the food that can be very tasty because of the long time that the spice molecules are allowed to enter deep into the fiber of the meat so that's uh, well anyway that's a, that's a different issue but uh, that's how pressure cookers work so the point that i'm trying to tell you is that increased pressure increased pressure discourages or hinders further boiling ei jisha bujhcho kina joto beshi pressure dibo boil korar jonno she toto beshi badha prapto hobe ebong she jonno take she toto beshi high temperature achieve korar try korbe does it make sense ji sir okay which means this thing is equally applicable for evaporation if the atmospheric pressure is high on a certain day then the evaporation rate would be what less and if the atmospheric pressure is less then evaporation would be high pretty much the same process how a pressure cooker works only in this case for the case of evaporation is applied for a much bigger scale that atmospheric pressure and an open container এবং এই 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 ইভাপোরেশনের চ্যাপ্টার থেকে কিছু মজা মজার এম সিকিউ হয় যেমন আমি তোমাদের একটা সিম্পল একটা এম সিকিউ দেখাই ইফ ইউ হ্যাভ এ বিকার অফ ইউনিফর্ম কনস্টিটিউশনাল এরিয়া ওভার দ্য ডিউরেশন অ্যাজ দ্য ওয়াটার লেভেল উইল ড্রপ বিকজ অফ ইভাপোরেশন দ্য রেট অফ ইভাপোরেশন উইল রিমেন দ্য সেম রেট অফ ইভাপোরেশন ইট মিনস হাউ মেনি গ্রামস অফ ওয়াটার অর মিলি গ্রামস অফ ওয়াটার উইল বি ইভাপোরেটেড লেটস এভরি মিনিট rate of evaporation will remain the same considering all the other factors remain the same temperature of the air humidity if everything remains the same for a container that has uniform constitution area you will have the same evaporation rate but that's not the case for a conical flask or for a petri dish 
a conical flask looks like this. <laughs> Let's say a certain liquid or a conical flask is filled up up to this level and you are allowing it to, uh, you are allowing uh, uh, evaporation. What would happen as the level of this water, uh, as the level of this water slowly goes down? What would happen to the surface area? Should it remain constant or should it become more or should it become less? This is the water. As the water level will drop due to evaporation, what happens to this open surface area? Increase. It does increase. Do all of you see that it is increasing? It does increase. So, because if the if the if the surface area actually increases, then the evaporation rate should also do what increase, which means that if you place a conical flask uh, out in the open, let's say, uh, and you are not careful to uh, cover it up, uh, and if it's a volatile liquid, you'll see that initially it is not dropping pretty fast, but as it drops further, it is going to keep perishing even faster. And there's the op opposite thing if you have. Uh, if you have a petri dish, a petri dish in the chemistry lab looks like this. If you have some water kept in a petri dish, I'm trying to show the whole thing as a curve. So as the water level will go down, you'll have smaller and smaller cross-sectional area, oh, 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 sorry, surface area of the water. So as water level goes down, the level, the evaporation rate will decrease because of the decrement of uh, surface area. This has nothing to do with depth. For example, if you have a beaker of this much cross-sectional area where it has this much water, the amount of evaporation rate would be exactly the same if you, have a, if you have a similar beaker which was filled up even more. If you have these two beakers placed side by side, which are identical beakers, but they're filled up with water by different height, both of them would have the same rate of evaporation because depth of water is not a factor that controls evaporation. The factors that control the evaporation rate, what are those? Surface area, temperature, humidity, air, air flow on the liquid, type of liquid and pressure. These are the factors. Depth of liquid does not matter. So if the surface areas are same, then both of these containers would have the same rate of evaporation. Another interesting thing that can be shown you is that for round flasks, round flasks usually looks like this. They have a tall uh, tube like opening and then they have a round body. Okay, not the best of the circles. Uh, Okay, let's say something like this. Now, if you have water filled up up to this level, and if you allow evaporation happen, how would the evaporation rate change for this container to, uh, uh, up to the point of container becoming completely empty? I'm asking the question again, slowly. This container is filled up with water up to this part. So this part is open. And water is allowed to evaporate. There is no cap over here or oh, here. If you put a cap over here, evaporation will ultimately stop. Because if you put a cap over here on any of this container as well, the, the, this trapped air would become saturated pretty fast or it become 100% humid pretty fast and no more, no further evaporation will happen. But if you do not put the cap in, if we allow the uh, uh, produced vapor to escape, how would the rate of evaporation change for this container uh, till the point the container becomes completely empty? How would that change? I mean, yes, so to follow. Okay, that's correct. But can you specify more? Uh, sir, because middle part uh, surface area exposed on a basin and at the bottom area our low. Yeah, what Shatushi said is pretty much uh, uh, is quite correct because what happens for this round plus is that if I draw a halfway line to the most wide level of the round flask for whenever the water level will drop from here to this level slowly you will have increased surface area increased surface area will increase rate of evaporation and whenever it's going to start dropping from this level let me draw the green then you will slowly have decreased surface area which means for this much drop of depth evaporation rate will increase for this much drop of depth depth evaporation rate will decrease to see Why isn't the uh, 
uh, because we are keeping it out in the open. So we are assuming that no matter how much atmosphere, no matter how much we are assuming that no matter how much uh, uh, evaporation or water or steam or vapor molecules are produced, they are capable to leave out through this tube uh, into the atmosphere readily. So we are considering that the, I mean, one thing is obviously true. I mean, if we have, actually, let me just show you one thing. <clears throat> if we have two round flasks, one of this much, oops, one of this much height, and the second one having a lower height of tube. So this is exposed to the atmosphere earlier. You have to understand that this one will have a general or overall lower rate of evaporation compared to this because here the atmospheric part, the water molecules can escape pretty easily. Here they have to travel a pretty far away distance. The tube length can be a factor if the tube lengths are different for two different containers. But if you are having a tube length same for the same experiment, then the tube length is not a variable. So that wouldn't affect you. Could I answer your question? Yes, sir. I got it. Very good. Mm, that's pretty much it for evaporation as far as I can recall. I think I think that's pretty much it. We covered pretty much everything about evaporation. I am taking so much time or quite an entire class for evaporation because evaporation happens to be one of the quite favorite uh, topic for a lot of examiners and this tend to set a lot of quite good examples. Questions? from your portion chapter, both in MCQ and also in paper two. MCQ questions are pretty easy to answer, answer because there are not so many difficult things if you can logically understand this thing. But paper two questions for your portion can prove to be tricky. I'm not gonna say difficult. They can prove to be tricky because, because you have to write it in a consequential order that this is happening because of this, this is gonna happen. This will lead to this and ultimately this will happen. If you mess up this order, even if all of your informations are correct, you might not get full marks. And if you don't get the whole process, that's a totally different thing. And that's in that case, me and you, I and you both are unsuccessful at uh, communication. <clears throat> I hope that never happens. I sincerely hope, although it happens every once in a while. I want that not to happen. But my point is that uh, you have to be able to write evaporation questions answer. To be honest, every physics answer should be right in a proper consequential order. You start from the very first happening and there's a cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect. And finally, the final thing comes up. Any question, anyone? <coughs> Achha. Tomade Ramjana class ami propose korsi lam hoche existing weekdays gulari shakal bala shayna taba doshta dikha mona hoy. If as far as I remember, when we discussed that at a pretty early date, is that possible? So school. <laughs> School is school open, then the school is immediate proper post. If I'm correct. I mean, somewhat like, I think from 3 p.m. or something like that. And I, I said that the Ramadan classes would be one and a half hour only. So 3 p.m. is a shop day possible. So Tuesday is the same day. So Tuesday is the same day. So Tuesday is the same day. So Tuesday is the same class. Of course. I if there are a class name, 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 if there are a class if there are a That wouldn't work. Technically, it wouldn't. And I'm using Budbar Bully, the Hajaj Budbar Dino, the Honorable Subject of Chia Prose. Budbar didn't get to Makoto Arba. The Budbar Tamar Devashi Sarat. Robar? Ona Sir Budbar have a name. Sir Amas. Thank <laughs> you.
দেখো আমি আমি তোমাদেরকে একটা সিম্পল জিনিস বলি ঠিক আছে আমি যে এখন শুধু তোমাদের ক্লাস ছাড়া আর কারোরই ক্লাস নিতেছি না সো টেকনিক্যালি স্পিকিং মাই এন্টার ডে ইজ ব্ল্যাঙ্ক এন্ড আই শুড বি এবল টু টেক ক্লাসেস ইন এনি অফ দ্য স্লটস আর রমজানে একটা সুবিধা হচ্ছে তোমার ইফতারের আগে তো অনেক লম্বা একটা সময় আমরা না খাই থাকি সো তখন ঘুমায় যাওয়ার কোনো সম্ভাবনা নাই অ্যাজ ফার অ্যাজ আই থিঙ্ক দ্যাটস নট গোনা হ্যাপেন ইয়েস স্যার আগে তো পিছে গিয়ে সব টিচাররা রমজানের রুটিনটা দেখ তারপরে আমরা ফিক্স করি এখনো তো 14 দিন বা তোমাদের কি রমজানে ফুল ছয় ঘন্টা ক্লাস হবে আটটা থেকে দুইটা পর্যন্ত বললে তো হইতই একদিকে হইল আর যদি আমি সাড়ে চারার দিকে নিতে চাই তাহলে হচ্ছে ওইদিকে ইফতার আগে অনেক মানে ভেজাল হয় প্লাস সাড়ে চারটার সময় যদি ক্লাস নেই তাহলে মাঝখানে আবার আসলে পেয়ার পড়বে তিনটা থেকে যদি সাড়ে চারটা বন্ধ নেই তাহলে মাঝখানে কোনো পেয়ার ব্যাগ পড়তেছে না বাকি থাকলো কি ফ্রাইডে আমি ক্লাস নিবো না অন্য টাইমিং বলো আমি পারবো থেকে নিব আমি কার্যালয় ছিল
তাইলে আর নয়টার আগে ক্লাস কেজুল করা হচ্ছে অত্যাচার না আমি উঠতে পারবো না তোমরা উঠতে পারবা আর উঠা হচ্ছে কন্ট্রোলেসি মাথার ভিতরে তোমরা আমাকে গালি রাজ করবা আমিও তোমাদেরকে মাথা মনে মনে অভিশাপ দিতে থাকবো পলান করা কেন বলো একবার জামালা শেষ ঠিক আছে তোমরা যদি তোমরা যেটা চাও আমি দুইটার জন্যই ওকে মাসখানে যদি ভাঙতি চান চাও তাও ওকে সাড়ে দশটা থেকে বারোটা বন্ধ করবা তাও ওকে এগারোটা থেকে সাড়ে বারোটা বন্ধ করবা তাও ওকে কোনো সমস্যা নাই মানে হচ্ছে এই দশটা থেকে একটার মধ্যে আমরা একটা দেড় ঘন্টা স্লট নিব যদি স্কুলের স্কুল যদি না হয় দ্যাটস ওয়ান থিং বাট স্কুল হবে এটা প্রেজিউম করে যদি আমরা আমরা রুটিন করি তাহলে কি করা যায় আচ্ছা ওয়েডনেস ডেতে কি ওয়েডনেস ডেতে হচ্ছে দেবাশিস স্যার ক্লাস করা থেকে 3টা থেকে 5টা জি স্যার ব্যাচ 2 জি আর টুজডে হচ্ছে ব্যাচ 1 টুজডে তে স্যার ব্যাচ 2 আ থার্সডে তে যেন কি প্রবলেম বলছিলা স্যার ব্যাচ 1 এর 3টা থেকে 5টা জি স্যার আচ্ছা দাঁড়াও মান্থ <laughs> এবং ওই সময় তোমার প্রচন্ড টায়ার্ডও থাকবা ক্ষুদার্ত থাকবা কিছু বুঝবা কিনা সেটা একটা কোশ্চেন কেন স্কুলগুলো খোলা রাখার দরকার কি স্যার আপনি একটা করতে পারেন ইফতারের পর নেওয়া যায় নাকি ইফতার পর স্যার দিস ইজ নট দি ভেরি ক্রেজি বাট আই থিংক ই লাইক ভেরি ইয়ারলি 7 অর 8 মিনিট করব আবার এখানে তো মাঝখান দিয়ে তারা দিয়ে শুনো শুনো এগারোটা পর্যন্ত ফ্রি সবাই হয় না অনেকে এগারোটা অনেক আগেই ঘুমাই যায় ঠিক আছে প্লাস হচ্ছে আমার সবাই এখানে তো এগারোটা পর্যন্ত তারাবি না তোমাদের স্কুল শেষ হওয়ার কথা প্যাগমেরিক কটার দিকে কি ক্লাস থাকবে 
শুরু হয় How about if I try to start from 130-ish? Devarshish sir, class 3 is sharp. Or is it like 315 or so? Sir, 316, 320. Okay. So, in this case, we have 130... Is it Sunday or Sunday? আমি যে কোনো এটা স্কুলের দিনগুলো যে কোনো দিনই হইতে পারে আমি ওটা তোমার চালা করছি যে লাস্ট পিরিয়ডের ক্লাসটা যদি তোমাদের জন্য কম্পালসরি না হয় ফর एग्जांपल ধরো লাস্ট পিরিয়ডে কমার্সে কোনো সাবজেক্ট দিয়ে আছে যেটা তোমার নাও নাই বা হচ্ছে লেটস সে লাস্ট পিরিয়ডে ওয়াট ক্যান আই সে অ্যানালিসিস সাবজেক্ট মানে বুঝছো তো কি বলতেছি ইয়েস আই ডোন্ট ওয়ান্ট টু নেম সাবজেক্ট বিকজ দ্যাট মাইট সাউন্ড ডিসরেসপেক্টফুল টু সাম পিপল এন্ড আই এম নট শিওর ওয়াই আই এম স্টিল রেকর্ডিং দিস থিং 